Hello and welcome. This will be a lecture on Probit and Logit models. Here's a quick overview of what I will cover in this lecture. First, I will give a few examples of the Probit and Logit models and how you can apply these models. Then I will talk about the nature of the binary de dependent variable, which is a zero one variable. Next, I will compare the linear regression model, the Probit and the Logit models, their functional forms and properties. Next, I will talk about the model coefficients and the interpretations for those coefficients. We will then talk about a very important uh, topic of marginal effects and odds ratios and their interpretations. Next, we will talk about goodness of fit statistics or the percent correctly predicted and the pseudo R squared that are typical when using these binary models. Uh, then I will talk about the choice between the Probit and the Logit model, which model you, you should use. And finally, I will talk a little bit about the economic models that lead to the use of the Probit and Logit models. So what are the Probit and Logit models? These are binary outcome models. And here are a few examples from consumer economics, whether a consumer makes a purchase or not, from labor economics, we have whether an individual participates in the labor market or not. And from agriculture economics, you could have whether or not a farmer adopts or uses organic practices or marketing or production contracts and so on. Notice that in all of these examples, the dependent variable is uh, basically has two choices. You either do something or don't do something. You have something or you don't have something. Uh, there are just two choices, and these binary uh, choices are typically coded as 0 and 1. This is just a convention. It doesn't have to be, uh, but that's what statistical uh, software typically ex expects. So here, um, this is how the y variable would be defined. It would be a 0 if, if it's no or don't have something, and 1 if it's yes. Sometimes you may code it differently depending on the situation, but this is the most typical use of, of, um, of the binary models. Okay, so these binary outcome mo models or the Probit and Logit models are amongst the most used in applied economics behind the uh, typical linear regression model. So here is a look at the OLS model. We have y, the dependent variable, which is typically a continuous variable. You know, it could take numbers anywhere from, uh, you know, from minus infinity to infinity, um, or positive numbers or something like that, would be equal to x prime beta plus e. This is a model that you guys should have seen uh, from before. Now, the binary outcome models, instead of having y as a, continu a continuous variable here, it would model the probability of y equals 1. Because now remember, y can only take two values, either 0 or 1. So instead of modeling this, this value of y itself, we're modeling the probability that y would be taking a value of 1. And that would be equal to f, a certain functional form of x prime beta. So this is how these models are going to look like. And we would have three different types of models depending on the functional form of this x prime beta. So the first one is the regression model or the linear probability model. In this case, this f, f of x prime beta would be equal to x prime beta, basically a linear function. And you would have a probability would be equal to x prime beta. Now, there are many problems with this model, but one of the biggest one is that the predicted probability would not be limited between 0 and 1 because there's no restriction on this function here to be between 0 and 1. So you could have a, a predicted probability here that would maybe less than 0 or more than 1, which would make no sense. So although several textbooks are talking about this linear regression model, we are actually not going to use it um, when we have uh, binary outcome models. The two models that we will use are the logit model and the probit model. The difference between them is the f function. f 
of x prime beta. And this is the cumulative distribution function of the logistic distribution in case of the logit model. And we have a function that is e to x prime beta divided by 1 plus e to x prime beta. So this is the case of a binary model. And in later le lectures, we're also going to think about what would happen if we have more than two choices for the dependent variable, such as multinomial models. But in this case, we just have two choices. So this is actually equivalent to, to this, uh, this is a different notation for the, for the same expression. So this would be the probability that y would be equal to 1. So my question to you is, what is the probability that y would be equal to 0? And in this case, it would be 1 minus this expression, because those two probabilities have to sum up to 1. And therefore, the probability of y would be equal to 0 would be 1 divided by 1 plus exponent of x prime beta. Um, so this is how the logit model would, would look like. And one of the advantages of the logit model is that these predicted probabilities are limited between 0 and 1. You can see how this cannot be less than 0 because it's an exponent function and it cannot be greater than 1 either. So for the probit model, we would have this function uh, f of x prime beta to be the CDF of the standard normal distribution and this will be the functional form of the standard normal distribution that you have seen from statistics classes. And so again, one of the advantages of a probit model is that those predicted probabilities would be limited between 0 and 1. So as you can see, these two models have very uh, different functional forms, uh, but um, kind of like uh, if you use one or the other, actually you're going to get very similar results. So now let's talk about the model coefficients. Uh, these are the functional forms that we are going to be estimating from the previous slide. And when we use the maximum likelihood method, we're going to come up with the coefficients for these models. How do we interpret those coefficients? Uh, we would say that uh, these would be the beta coefficients. And we would say that an increase in the independent variable x would increase or decrease the likelihood that y would be equal to 1. That makes the outcome more or less likely. Uh, in other words, we would say that an increase in x makes the outcome um, more, more or less likely. Notice that the key word here is more or less likely because in a typical regression model, you will say higher x would lead to higher y. Instead of saying here higher x would lead to higher y, we are talking about the, the y being more likely to be 1. Uh, that's the interpretation. So in this case, we would also interpret um, the sign of the coefficients, if it's positive or negative, but not the magnitude itself. And the reason for that is that we cannot interpret the magnitude because the coefficients uh, for these different models have different scales. So here are these scales uh, which differ because of their functional forms. So the coefficients for a logit model would be approximately four times the coefficients of an OLS model. Probit would be about 2.5 the coefficients of an OLS model and the logit coefficients would be 1.6 of those of probit models. So that's why don't interpret the magnitude itself, just say more or less likely. Uh, and likewise, you can now compare the magnitude of these coefficients among different models. So one, one thing that's very useful uh, when we talk about the probit and the logit models is to talk about marginal effects. Uh, so it's very common to report these marginal effects after reporting the coefficients because you can interpret the, uh, the, uh, the magnitudes for those marginal effects. And they would reflect the change in probability of y equals 1 given a one unit change in the independent variable x. So in a regression model, one thing that you have is uh, dp uh, over dxj would be equal to beta j. So j here 
the index j would refer to the jth independent variables. So if we have seven independent variables, we would have seven coefficients that we would be estimating. Uh, now notice that usually a, an i index, which is not here, we would refer that to the ith observation, basically how many rows are in the data. Um, so going back to the marginal effects of the regression model, we would have them as simply being the coefficients. That's why when you estimate an OLS model, you, you look at the coefficient and you can interpret the magnitude as well. And you could say one unit change in x leads to, say, 0.3 units change in y. But you cannot do this necessarily for the probability and the logit model. And here is why. These are the marginal effects. Uh, for, for them. If you take the derivative dp uh, to uh, dxj and if you look at the functional forms uh, a few slides earlier you're going to have x prime uh, I mean f prime of x prime beta times beta j because this is typically a nonlinear function and therefore you also have to take the derivative uh, with, with respect to uh, x here and that would leave the beta j out. Um, so the marginal effects would depend on x uh, because this, this functional form here will not drop out. And that's why um, this is one of the challenges for the probability and the logit models is that we need to decide which x's to calculate these marginal effects at. And typically that would be at the means, but there's also um, other other methods including the average marginal effects. So one thing to note here is that the coefficient and marginal effects would have the same signs because f prime of x beta is positive. So basically this thing right here, this expression would be always positive. Therefore whatever sign the coefficient would take, the same sign uh, would, would be for the marginal effect. And we would see that's not always the case with the multinomial models, but it is true in the binary models where you only have two choices for the dependent variable. So the marginal effects for the logit model, if you take a derivative of the expression uh, that I showed you on the previous slide, basically this is the expression that you would have. And again, you see that you are going to have some uh, x would also be here in the form and you also will have this beta j, the coefficient. Uh, the marginal effect for the probit model, that would be the PDF of the standard normal distribution, and then you will have this multiplied by beta j. Uh, so again, the most important thing to remember about these marginal effects, they would have x in them, and they would also have the same signs as beta j. Okay, so how do you uh, estimate those marginal effects. There are two methods. The first one is to do to estimate marginal effects at the mean. So where where you have dp uh, over dxj, um, and you have this expression here, you replace x with x bar, which means that these would be the the uh, average x across all the sample or the uh, um, x for the average person in the sample. So one of the problem is that there may not be such person in the sample. So for example, suppose that one of your deep independent variables is whether or not you're a female. Uh, and if there are 60% uh, female in the sample, you will have 60% of ones and 40% of zeros. Well, the average for that would be 0.6, which means that you basically, the average person in the sample would be something like 60% female. Well, that doesn't make sense because there's no such person in the sample. Um, and this is one of the problems when you calculate um, the marginal effects at the mean is that their values, once you average them, there may not be such, such actual person or it doesn't apply to anyone. Uh, the, the, the value of this independent variable. So because of that, you can do, you can calculate average marginal effects, which are the marginal effects are estimated as the average of the individual marginal effects. So now for each person, you can plug back uh, in the uh, values for the coefficients and their own axis, 
and then you just calculate an average of that for basically the whole sample and you replace this um, uh, as the average marginal effects. So this is a better approach but most papers still use the previous approach and if uh, we look at some examples which we will look at later on you will see that these two ways produce almost identical results most of the time so in practice it really doesn't matter which one you use so now how to calculate partial effects for discrete variables so suppose you have a discrete variable say of um, k equals zero like you have a variable like the whether or not a person is male or female. So if it's male, that would have a value of 0. If it's female, that would have a value of 1 here. So one way to uh, calculate um, these partial effects for a change, like if someone, what if someone is female, is to calculate this expression for a female just by plugging in the value of 1 here, and then calculate the same expression for male and then just take the difference of these two functions and you basically would have th what's the effect of a change of you know uh, going from a, a male to a female what would be the effect on the probability of y equals one uh, that's how you'll calculate it so interpretation of marginal effects um, in this case you can go ahead and interpret the magnitude and you would say that increasing x increases or decreases the probability that y would be equal to 1 by the marginal effect expresses the percentage. So for a dummy independent variable, the marginal uh, effect would be expressed in comparison to base category. As I talked about, uh, say, male or female, or say if someone is retired, then they could be 3% more likely to have insurance compared to those that are not retired. So that's the base category that we are comparing them to. For continuous independent variables, where you have like uh, maybe the number of years of education, then the marginal effect would be expressed as a one unit change in X. So basically for each additional year of education, you're so many more percent more likely to, um, to say have insurance or something like that. And in this case, we would interpret both the sign and the magnitude of the marginal effects. And uh, one thing that we will see in practice is that the probit and the logit models would produce almost identical marginal effects when you use um, software to estimate these models. One, uh, one concept that some economists use is the odds ratio, also called the relative risk of for the logit model. And the odds ratio would measure the probability that y would be equal to 1 relative to the probability of y would be equal to 0. So that's p, the probability of y equals 1, divided by the probability of y equals 0 is 1 minus p. If this is p, uh, and you can see that from the logit model, then 1 minus p would be 1 divided by this expression and basically, if you divide these two expressions, we would have exponent of x prime beta. And if you rework this expression by taking logs from both sides, uh, this, is, this is what you will have here. So an interpretation would be that the odds ratio of 2 would mean that the outcome of y equals 1 would be twice as likely as the outcome of y equals 0. Uh, and um, so basically, uh, this differs from the marginal effects a little bit because you compare the outcome of y equals 1 in comparison to the uh, y equals 0. And so if you have odds ratios of 1, they're just about equally likely, and more than 1 would be that the outcome of y equals 1 would be more likely, and less than 1 would be that the outcome of y equals 0 uh, would be more likely. Um, so some social scientists are using these odds ratios, but they're not as popular in economics. Okay, so now uh, I will talk about predicted probability and goodness of fit measures, uh, which are maybe good to report in papers. 
So after estimating the models, we can predict the probability that y would be equal to 1 for each observation. How do you do that? Well, you basically have the estimated coefficients, beta hat, and you just plug them in. And for each person, you calculate this p hat, which is the um, predicted probability. So if you have uh, 60 observations, you can calculate 60 predicted probabilities. So for the regression model, these predicted probabilities would not be limited between 0 and 1, and that's why you want to use the probit and the logit models. So this predicted probability would indicate uh, the likelihood of y equals 1. So if you plug that in the model, you would get a number like 0.3. Um, so you're 0.3 uh, or 30% likely to have insurance. So um, you can either work with that number or you can, um, you can have the 0.5 as a cutoff value and you can say if it's greater than 0.5 you will predict that that person is likely to have insurance and otherwise that that person is not likely to have insurance. So you can use this 0 0.5 as, as the cutoff value in which you put those predicted probabilities equal to 1 or 0. Or you can use another number, such as you can have the sample frequency. You know, what's, what's the proportion of people that have y equals 1, and you use that as, as a cutoff value. So here are some measures, uh, goodness of fit, uh, statistics that are used um, when, uh, when estimating these probability and logic models. And one such concept is the percent correctly predicted values. Uh, so basically you can, after you predict those uh, values, you can change them equal to y or 0. And then we can create the following table right here. Uh, it could be the case that the actual value is y equals 0. That would come from your data. Uh, or the actual value may be 1 from the data. And you can predict that y hat would be equal to 1 or y hat would be equal to 0. In this case, when the actual value is 0 and you're predicting it to be equal to 0, you will have a true case. Your model worked well. Likewise, if the actual value is 1 and you predicted it to be equal to 1, you will again have a true case. But it's possible that uh, the actual value is 0 and you're predicting it to 1. In this case, you will have a false prediction and same for here. So here we have four cases. Two of them are correct predictions and two of them are false predictions. So the percent correctly predicted values would be the proportion of the true predictions to total predictions. So basically, you see how many cases are predicted as true in these two categories. You sum this up, and then you divide it by the total number of observations. And you will have a percent correctly predicted values. Now, if you have a model that predicts correctly 50%, uh, would you say that that's a good uh, uh, goodness of fit statistic, that's a good model. Well, in this case, you basically, you have it almost as good as random. If <laughs> half the time you predicted correctly, half of them not. So you want those to be kind of high, like at least 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that, in order for you to have a, uh, a good model. This is not like the R square where even 0 0.25 is good you want high numbers here, like above 0.7 or something like that. The next one that you can use um, a, is a uh, pseudo R-squared, or also called a McFadden's R-squared. And this statistic is calculated like that. It's 1 minus the likelihood of an unrestricted uh, log likelihood that uh, for the model that we're estimating, divided by the likelihood for the restricted model where you have only an intercept. So all of these coefficients here, betas, are uh, restricted to be equal to zero. And in this case, uh, if the independent variables have no explanatory power, this unrestricted model would be basically the same as the restricted one. And this would be close to one, this ratio, so therefore we would have r squared of zero. 
So that's kind of like a way to go at uh, coming up with a measure of R squared that people feel comfortable with. Um, and this is again, if you have a value of anything above 0.25, you're probably you have a, a decent model. Okay, a few points here of discussion about these binary outcome models. A lot of people ask me about the choice between the probit and logit model, which one you should use. So the choice basically depends on the data generating process, which we don't know. And in practice, both models produce almost identical results. Uh, you have different coefficients, but similar marginal effects. And I would say the choice is up to you. Just pick one um, and use it. Uh, sometimes I've seen like when you have models that are too many observations, too many variables or something like that, then the probit model is usually less likely to converge. Uh, so the launch model is easier to estimate. But other than that, uh, whichever model you use, it's okay. Another point that I have here is about the coding of the dependent variable. You can reverse the categories 0 and 1, and if you do that, then the size of the coefficients would be reversed. Uh, so positive coefficients would become negative and vice versa, but the magnitudes would be the same. So be careful how you define that dependent variable. Like um, in some cases, you may want to predict what is the likelihood that someone would have insurance. In other cases, uh, it may make more sense to predict what's the chance that someone will not have insurance and that to be the, the um, dependent variable. So you're, you, you have a choice there what, what to do. Now, if you want to use some economic models that justify the use of the probit and the logit models, uh, these would be le latent uh, variable models. And in this case, we would have a latent variable that is incompletely observed. And we can denote this by Y star. So these variables can be introduced into binary models in two ways using index functions and the random utility models. If you use index function models, um, so here's a latent variable, um, and that would be an index of unobserved propensity for the event to occur. So these index models are used in two steps. And so, for example, you may not observe how much people want to work, only if they work or not. So if they have a positive amount of desired work hours, you will observe that they work. And if they have a negative amount of desired work hours, hours you will observe that they don't work. So this Y star, the latent variable, is not observable. What you observe is the choice, 0 or 1. So that's a good way to define a probit and logit model. Another one uh, is to use random utility models. And in this way, the latent variable would be the difference in utilities if the event occurs or it does not occur. And so, for example, a consumer can choose one product or another depending on which utility is higher. So here's the utility of consuming product zero, and here's the utility of consuming product one. And in this case, you will have someone, the probability of someone consuming product one would be the probability of the consumption of the product one being uh, higher than the utility of, of the consum consumption of product zero. And in this way, you can justify the use of a probit or a logit model. Okay, and that's all I had for the probit and logit models. This is the theoretical uh, introduction. I also have videos about uh, an example using real data set in uh, one of the three software on how to estimate these models and how to interpret the results. So please make sure you watch these as well. And thank you for stopping by.